start. I'll just uh, start the recording. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, in another ArchiTalk. Um, I would like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation. I would like to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Um, my name is Parisa Izatanahi, and I am a senior lecturer at Curtin University. Uh, we are uh, honored to host um, Architalks, and um, today is the 28th Architalk um, since we initiated that on May, I think it was, yeah, um, the 1st of May 2019. So that's, that's fabulous. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, I'm honored to introduce our keynote speaker today, Lucien Hicks. Um, Lucien um, will take us through um, the topic people, um, places, and things. Um, Lucien is an associate urban designer at Cox, bringing over 20 years of international, professional, and academic place-led urban design and landscape experience. Stemming from an architecture background, Lucien's conscious path into landscape and urban design has been driven by a belief that contemporary environments require an interdisciplinary approach, merging research and professional uh, lenses to urban design, landscape, climate, culture, economics and more to observe and to facilitate feasible, holistically sustainable and enduring um, 21st century urban places. Having worked with Cox, Lendlease and Sasaki Associates in Boston, she consciously sought to return home to Australia in 2019. Welcome back. Now, her global experience has instilled a multitude of perspectives and ideologies that drive a place-led practice to each project, research, and equity and diversity groups, constantly seeking to think, hope, and look for ways to meaningfully engage and to act with authenticity. The success of Lucien's work is evident in the recognition by multiple global awards, including being awarded the Pierre L'Enfant International Planning Excellence Award for the American Planning Association, the Honor Award from the American Institute of Architects, Fast Company, WAN, the Plan, SCUP, BSLA, BSA, and other professional groups. Wow, that's a long list of um, awards. Um, that's fascinating. Thanks, Lucien. Just hand it over to you. Um, and I would please ask you to share your screen first. Thank you. Great. I might as well do that. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. And it's just such a thrill. Um, I'll share my screen and just make sure I figure out how to do that. Because we're three years into or two years into COVID, feels like longer. Oh wow, that's fun. Um, and there we are. So can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Really. So thank you very much. I'll get stuck into it. So this is very much a nice conversation, I think. Um, I'm just so excited. This is like a topic of mine that I'm so passionate about over the years. Uh, it's simple. It's a simple title like that. I think the title came up years ago as a working idea, and I just I can't find a better title than what placemaking is. It's people, it's things, it's places. And so even here, like this is my niece's and nephew playing in Sydney's Darling Quarter, and you just look at this. There's people, there's landscape, there's activity, there's this environment, and this is kind of an attractive place. Um, thank you also for doing the acknowledgement of country. I think also here, I'd like to recognize the land in which I'm currently on, which is the Galico lands of the Aura Nation, which you can see here is, and I think that's a nice dovetail into one of the aspects of place I might begin with is really the scales or the different elements of place. And one of those is scale. And I think place at its very core is the genius loci of place. And in this case, Sydney Harbour, the Gadigal lands as well. It's, it's 
this whole historic regional scale and place. And if you, you can almost say what would define Sydney, if you thought of Sydney as a place, I think it's the harbour, really. You might go and say that the harbour is Sydney's blood, if you will, and I'll come back to that in a bit. But just even place exists at the regional scale, the city-wide scale, even the national scale some ways. Um, and that extends in the same harbour into subcomponents of that, which in this case is the neighbourhood. In this case, we see Rushcutters Bay and Double Bay on the eastern suburbs. Um, you might notice that I'm from Sydney. A lot of my examples are from Sydney, so I'll try and explain them so everyone understands. Um, and you're kind of in the loop. But you can see here on this larger loci of place, there are a series of sub places, these neighbourhoods, these bays in this instance, and which themselves hold very particular characteristics of place. And that extends to the next one, which is local. And this is Parsley Bay, which is further to the east of the harbour. And in here, it's just this very small, almost like a moment in time, but it's a moment in place where it's just sitting by the harbour. Like I took the photo so I can imagine how it felt, but it's the warmth, the breeze, the current, people fishing, people lying on the boardwalk with towels, the oysters. It's just this local domestic scale in amongst something grand. And I think that's a topic we'll come back to about the scale of things. Um, if we look at what place is, people, 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 people. Um, and it's so amazing, this photo here. This is a laneway, a back alley. And it's not like a laneway in like what Melbourne may have. Sydney's laneways are very much still service laneways. And here you can see, what have we got? We've got milk crates, we've got a bit of mural, we've got people. And what's happening here is that they're waiting for their coffee across the laneway. But just suddenly, just it becomes a place. It's almost immaterial. It's just these components. Um, place is landscape. And I think the trees, I'll always talk about trees make a place. You have, there's a development near our office here with one tree in the whole cove, and it makes the place. Like, and just trees here, this is particularly special. This is Hyde Park. This is the main concourse through it where it's almost like nature's cathedral, if you will. Place is environment. You look at this, this is Barang the Waterman's Key, and it's basically, you can see there's a larger key here. It's a place in the sun. And what the kind of place here I'm kind of hinting at is this two people on the right, where just by just sitting, it's a place in the sun. And it's almost like its own little place in amongst something bigger. Place is shade that in the heat of summertime, and this is actually in Boston and Harvard Square, where in the summertime, the sun is quite intense. So we're actually providing this shade, this microclimate, this environmental system, which makes it a nice place to be. And also doesn't hurt that it's very colorful, doesn't hurt that it flaps in the wind, and it's actually a temporal artwork, which they put up in the summertime. And it starts to make a place in amongst the people, the food trucks, and just the sort of summertime activities of public domain and seating. Uh, place is culture and sort of whether it's controlled or it's uncontrolled doesn't really matter. I think it's a place of public expression. And here, this is at Bondi Beach, and you can see here these murals here by a very Sydney, popular Sydney graffiti artist. And you know, everyone loves unicorns, not just my daughter who's there reaching for them. Um, they sort of make something very interesting. Place is festive. Um, here we see Pitt Street Mall, the main retail spine of Sydney, which during the evenings normally is not active. It's one of the few places in Sydney that is not lit by street lights at night, um, which suggests don't be there. But here during the Christmas period, this ceiling of lights is put up and becomes a whole place just for that time, a place where people want to come and take photos and just be. And it's not just for shopping. Place is ephemeral. Uh, here are the New Year's Eve fireworks, and I think one of the grandest settings, if I'm a little biased, of um, Sydney Harbour, the New Year's Eve fireworks. And in this, it's almost like with the summer's heat, people want to be out in the larger spaces. And here it's that harbour again, you see the large scale of the harbour. Um, and with that, the event. And this is such a fun photo for me because it's back in 2008, before Barangaroo was redeveloped, it's when it was a concrete deck. And this, if anyone remembers, was actually, that's the Pope. Giving, a, giving mass. And it was one of the only places they could find in Sydney that was large enough to accommodate such an event. And it's so amazing here that they unlocked this very industrial platform. And really all it is is people, a couple of fences, and you know you can see some pavilions, but 
this makes a place. And I just love that the light is coming out from the clouds like it's God himself talking. Um, places also, like I mentioned summertime, it's year round. And placemaking should also consider the climatic events and occurrences. And while Sydney and Australia does have a relatively mild seasonal system compared to say Canada here, it's still very much potent in place and activity. Um, I, this is one of my great ones. This is back, I finally got to go as a climate nerd in 2014 to the Carnival de Quebec. And this is really about, you can see the winter carnival and at what the point is here, and it's similar to what we have now with Vivid, which is ongoing in Sydney right now, is how do you create activity during the winter time? There is an urban activity, it's much more nuanced, but it's still very much there. And then also places in between. And this is great too, because this is when they're putting the light rail down George Street in Sydney, now complete. But at this time, it was very much still under construction. And they had a series of concrete blocks set up around it for security purposes, you know, for stop a truck coming through. But what kind of happened, it's almost like what I call love amongst the ruins, where people started to sit on them and have lunch. People started to stand on them and perform, for street performing at night. And it became this sort of interstitial, informal use, which I just think is so wonderful. Like again, it's immaterial, it can be a milk crate. And places for all, as I hear I say all ages, like this is actually Christmas tree lighting in Sydney, Santa's about to go by and all these three-year-olds and four-year-olds about to lose it. Um, so that's really quite special. The place is for all ages and also just to bring it home, places for all. And I think this is one of the more political points I can make around place is democratic, it is public, it is for public use and for public exhibition, even protest here. And we can also agree, I think this year has been a pretty big year for trans communities. And here's a protest I attended and just really looking at how do we ensure that public space and place is public. It isn't controlled, it isn't secured, secured in a way that can locks people out. It isn't exclusive. It is public and democratic. Um, so really, considering what I think kind of place is, kind of does come down to this here, which is actually a diagram prepared by the Project for Public Spaces in America. And I think this really encapsulates what are the elements and how do we have the tangible and the intangibles and the attributes and the measurements of each. And you can really see here, they've identified four key aspects of sociability, uses and activities, access and linkages, and comfort and image. And then around it, you can see the sort of intangibles, which is like, how does it feel really? And comfort and image, is it green? Does it feel safe? Is it charming? Is one, is it historic? Sort of the more landscape side. Sociability, is there a sense of pride, diversity, stewardship? Is it interactive? Does it feel welcoming? And then uses, how do they feel, celebratory, vital, active, fun, and then access and linkages about legibility and connectivity. And so this, this actually becomes a lens for one of my first projects I want to talk about, which is, I think the first project here is Project Cox are doing with Sydney Trains, looking at how we can look at existing train stations and increase the interface or enhance the interface between these existing stations and their communities. And so really here, process is the main idea. And this image, I just I just love this image. Like that looks photoshopped, but it's actually real. It's just they painted a rainbow on a crossing. It's still there years later, and it's such a joy. Um, and for this, we'll talk about process. And so really, what are the five key steps in this way for process? Place is not really an outcome or a product. It's a, like, it's more of an output, like something of a process that's always evolving. And I think right up front here, people, you've got to engage with people. Place is something that's already inherently there, even if you can't see it, it's defined in its own state presently. So you really want to identify and engage people. You want to, through that, evaluate the space and identify the issues that they may face. You, with them, I imagine, in very much engaging, is establishing a vision. And from here, you can really have some fun with some sort of short-term interim temporal interventions, which then, then actually serve as test beds for longer-term improvements. So you may not have budgets up front to do something large, but in the interim, while still planning for a larger intervention, 
test it with smaller things that the small term short term experiments can actually be a form of engagement in themselves so this is taking that process here taking those four quadrants we picked one train station in sydney which is lewisham in the inner west and we looked at it in different times of day different times of night across the week and a few different people from the team took site visits so we get a different experience like my perspective versus someone else's perspective could be quite different and feelings of it so we looked at sort of sociability looked at the graffiti looked at public art looked at street libraries and like through use of the activities of so looking at the sort of schools the churches residential uses empty shop fronts sort of getting a scale of that the access and linkages you see there's actually a subterranean platform going through it's not a very clear sense of connection and um, you don't really know where you're going. Wayfinding isn't very good. Um, and then that's not helped by the fact that with confident image, the lighting is very harsh. It drops off very quickly at night. It feels more like a security light versus a comfort light, like you're actually kind of in trouble. And lighting like this often makes you think that crime will happen here because they have to do light like this. Um, so we assessed it with that. And then what we kind of did in response, and this is just opportunities, was looking at different interventions here and this takes a quadrant but in a different way so what i'll say just to explain it is the bottom left is short term and low cost and toward the top right which is long term increased cost so between those two you've got the top left which is short term increased cost and bottom right is low cost but it takes a while to do it so you can see here the bottom left is really quick interventions like you can have planters, street libraries, yoga classes, you can paint a sidewalk, things that don't take a lot of time or cost, and they can actually be done by one authority rather than into collaborating. And these themselves would attract people and you can engage with them and say, what does this place need to be? Whereas at the up top left, things you could do quickly but take a lot of money would be including things like giant TV screens, stages that would actually lift up and down. Whereas on the right, we've got examples of low cost things like development control amendments, um, where it might actually not cost the government something because it would be up to the private sector to develop, but it would take a bit of time versus long-term high cost. And here is like examples of station redevelopments. So like Chatswood itself was very much almost starting from scratch. And so we started to look at a matrix of different examples of opportunities. And we started doing the, classic sort of analysis and opportunities here that you can see Lewisham Station here. And what we started to identify is sort of two main areas, the different entries of the north and south, and looking at how these areas and interventions could tie in with surrounding built form. You can see here the church, and you can see as well like this wall along the road here, there could be a chance at that, and different connections as well. There are existing active transport links in and around the station that could be enhanced. And so taking these, we sort of just did a very quick series of what we call provocations. And these are actually really fun. To and you can just taking here like a photograph of the area and just looking at some ideas and really breaking it down. What have we done? We're looking at adding some trees and adding a place for people. And in this case, maybe that the current area, which is a large turnaround bay for the church is only used once a month or so. So maybe you could actually block it for pedestrian use and make it into, hey, a roller skating area or a kid's playground or something for a while. And birds don't hurt either. Um, and then the other side of the station as well, looking at the opportunity here of actually making that retaining wall into a mural wall, um, actually enhancing pedestrian connections here so it isn't so vehicular dominated. And even perhaps there's a chance here suggested of an upper level connection. So versus for forcing people down into a tunnel where it floods, why don't we redevelop the building here um, and actually as part of that redevelopment have an upper level connection which would make it much more desirable as a public space and much safer we imagine as well um, further here this is a different train station and i won't go through the whole analysis because i think it's you've got the point um, this is green square which is one of the fastest growing urban districts in sydney it's a brand for development site near the airport um, large amounts of density, but not a large amount of public domain right now. There's a lot of proposals coming, but right now it's very traffic heavy. It's still largely industrial. Um, you can see here there's ideas of fencing. It's just a lot of traffic dominated areas. 
and sort of people sort of had to fit around it somehow. And so some of the ideas we had was looking at redirecting traffic to actually create public plazas that connect where people want to walk and actually connect the landscape and even public programming. And like, look, who doesn't love a giant bunny? It's just whimsical. It's, I think, fun. And people, I think we need a bit of that in our lives nowadays. Um, this is also Green Square, where the station is really defined by a very large asphalt plaza, which is there because under this plaza is the station. And you think, well, isn't it an opportunity to actually open up that plaza to actually connect down to the station more organically with bringing light down into the station, different amphitheater levels so people can sit there and have lunch or use it as a public space, uh, putting some planters in to actually allow for proper trees and just shielding from the car experience. And in this great space, you could also have some play areas and the kids always make something really exciting. Um, I'll move on to a second project now that we're working on in the office. Uh, this is a project called Precinct 75, which is in St. Peter's, which is in the inner west of Sydney. And I'll go to the next slide so you can see where it is. Um, if you don't know Sydney, I'll try and fill you in a little bit. This is the inner west. So Sydney is just the top right of the image. But we have got this really interesting environment here. We've got a lot of things going on. You can see that there is Sydney Park, which is a very large open space network. You've got this great M8 motor interchange here, which has got some public links being developed through it. You've got a series of highways coming up along the site around us. You've got a series of open spaces. You've actually got a flight path coming up this way from the airport to the south. And you've got these train stations in the area. The site in question is actually here. But when we start to look at this, the site really is the broader community. Because if you see it, it's one of the few kind of unfragmented areas you could actually have for development in the area. Um, so what we really started to look at was how does it fit into its community and how can it serve its community? What is its place? And a lot of the area around, this is zooming in a bit, is very much residential. And these residential areas really have very little amenity. There's very little retail. There's very little open space. It's actually public and useful. There's a small open space here, but it's a tiny little top lot, if anything. Um, you also have Unwards Bridge Road and Princess Highway here, which are major transport networks for cars, often traffic heavy throughout the day. Um, so really, any experience of anyone here in this community is going anywhere else is suddenly very heavy, heavily traffic. So we started to look at some ideas of what could we do in terms of picking up on this potential through road in the middle and actually connecting this place into its broader context that right now the site, I'm sorry if I skipped over it, is a series of factory buildings. It's an old paint factory. And right now, the actual series of buildings are populated with a brewery, uh, t-shirt shops, there's an axe throwing place. There's a series of basic interesting little amenities and attractions. And you know they kind of make it the interesting place it is. Um, so looking at the issues here as well is, like I mentioned, there's actually a fly path right over our site. So here you're going to have planes going straight down to the south to the airport all through the day. And so that's a consideration of if we're trying to create a public domain here, what's that going to be like when we've got increased aircraft noise? And also what that's going to be like if we have these developments and the open spaces are always in the shade. Like what's that? What are you, what are we creating? Um, and what we want to really create was something a place for the community and i think it was something really special that how do we balance development or redevelopment with gentrification to actually still have the local interest those small fragmented uses the kind of higgledy piggledy almost that make it so unique and vibrant how do we redevelop this and keep that without becoming something that gentrifies and then all the useful places that actually made it interesting can't afford it anymore and it just becomes like anywhere else. How do we actually be authentic in this? And we did a bit of benchmarking and here is not far from here. This is actually East Redfern and I used to live in this block so I can sort of speak about it too. And this was so interesting because we talk about placemaking always seems very highly public 
like about how do we get massive crowds through here? How do we kind of make it really popular? But what is also so fascinating and so important to get right is how do you balance it with a sense of privacy? What is private place for residents to be there? And how do we also give not just privacy, but a sense of ownership and a sense of neighborhood pride? And so here, this is actually quite a similar site if in a way because you've got South Downing Street, which is a very populous road as well. There's actually one of the highways running through it too. Burke Street's quite busy. Cleveland Street is a major east-west connector across Sydney. But in amongst it, you've got what I've been calling the secret garden. You've got Charles Street and Chelsea Street, and you've got Chelsea Street Reserve, which is the image on the top right. And you've got a series of residential uses. And you've also got these little laneways, which you can see here in the middle, which is pedestrian. Um, and they're really like hidden delights. But you've also got commercial uses. There's in the blue here is a different office, and there are, I think, 600 staff work in this building. So it's actually really interesting, very residential, very neighborhoody, and it still has commercial, and it still kind of has a hidden garden called a sense of pride. And what you can sort of see here on the bottom right is Charles Street, and the sort of sense of neighborhood pride here in that it's a sense of ownership that this, the residents put out plants along the street and maintain them. So when there's actually a sense of pride, there's a sense of it's going to be naturally maintained as well, which is always an issue with placemaking. Who's, what's the governance model and who's looking after it? So it became really interesting at the point of how can we achieve that here at Precinct 75? Um, we're looking, interrogating many ways that Precinct 75, there was a proposal of a central open space without any streets on it, which is quite an interesting conundrum or a proposal, it can be done well, it can also be done terribly. And so these proposals here, these are a few projects across the world, one in Brisbane, which is a similar scale of site, looking at how they've kept old industrial buildings and incorporated them into their sense of place. And here it was useful that the actual placemaking heritage is a significant part of placemaking. It's a natural identity, it's something people know that building is there. And if you keep it and actually keep it authentically, not just the facade, I think that's really quite beneficial. Um, in the middle is St. Margaret's, and I'm sorry to anyone on, on the audience, this public space is not very successful. It's central, it has connections, it has active edges, it has all these things that should make it very attractive, but it's been there 22 years or more and it's never really been successful. Um, so just understanding what pros and cons there are. And on the right is an open space in Boston, actually in Somerville, which is actually very much away from the street, but it's actually quite a special thing in that way, that you, it is hidden away, it is a discovery, and it's, it's like a bottleneck of activity. And I think understanding the different elements of that are very important and what they could be here. So I think the kind of lessons here you can almost see in the top middle, there's not, it's a residential edge, which is very quiet. Uh, they probably don't want activity here because it's noise and there might be complaints. And even like that fountain, you can't sit on the edge of it. So it's just this big thing in the middle of the space. It's also not very shaded. Whereas on the right, you've got these shade trees, which are seasonal. Um, so in winter, you get the sun, summer, you get the shade. There's active edges all around it and you can actually have external circulation. So you see activity all around. And I think that makes it really interesting. Um, so getting to the opportunities here for it, we sort of said the opportunities here is to unlock it, to enhance connections. Um, and so you can see here the ideas of what is what a connection is going to do. You've got street address here, um, the idea of people, and I think people will attract people. If you look at a place and you can see people hanging out there, you're actually going to walk in there more likely versus if it's empty. Um, legibility of links, you've got gateways like this fish lane here in Brisbane, um, which with some different markers of legibility throughout it. So you might have some of the buildings from Precinct 25 that we kept that people recognize as being the precinct and orient them through the precinct. Um, and then lighting. I think this is so interesting. Streetscape is so important, but nightscape is also so fundamental here. So have a sense of comfort, the right kind of lighting here, like legible links here, I said, but that image on the top right is really much about the different degrees of lighting here. And even you've got a cars going through it too, which is, I think gives it some activity. Um, we're looking at providing a comfortable environment. The current public domain, if you call it that, Precinct 75 is an industrial park. There's no trees, it's concrete, it's concrete buildings, brick buildings, concrete ground. 
no landscape, no shade except for the buildings, quite harsh. So here we're like, how do we make it more comfortable? And there's some ideas here, like on the bottom right is this second home project in Los Angeles, where it's the sort of use of canopies and trees with seating and just lighting that sort of make it this comfortable environment. I already spoke on this image on the right, and even just points of interest that want to bring you in. And that's here sort of the shading and a fountain. And I'll get to that in a second, where I think water is perhaps one of the best stages you could do in public domain. It's so flexible, it's dynamic. You can see here with Canary Square on the top, that this could be a splash pad for summer, children's play areas, and that could also be turned off and become markets or a outdoor plaza for cinemas or whichever you like. It's very dynamic. It can also be a great idea for lighting. You can turn the top right. And I think also, I've kind of hinted at it here, it can be quite tranquil and a great place of respite. That there's, I didn't have a photo, but there's this park I remember in Munich where there's a fountain at all four corners of it. And it's a very part, busy part of the city. And once you walk into it, those four fountains sort of make this sound wall. And once you're in the middle, you don't hear the city at all. You're in this other soundscape. And I think that could be really interesting here, considering the quite urban context, to create a place that is away from it. And coming back to this, it's a place for the community. And I think we're unlocking it for a wider market, of course, across Sydney and beyond, but it is very much about what can we provide? Like we said, there's very little open space, there's very little amenity for residents around that area. So what can we do to aid them? And I think programming for all ages, there could be childcare, there could be events over weekends and playgrounds, um, indigenous partnerships. I think this is fundamental in the same place is on the same legacy of place that goes well beyond ours. Um, community education, looking at agriculture and farming practices in the urban environment. And as I said before, like resident pride, like imagine that the harsh laneways now, the residents coming in might actually take ownership of some of these spaces. And really, this is actually in Melbourne, and it's quite a famous laneway. People come to see it because of these great plants that are just looked after by the residents. Um, as I mentioned, how do you nurture these businesses that are there and not just develop them out? And there's a lot of examples of this where flexible leasing policies, so they might actually be leasing for a short term for a different rate before you actually phase development. Um, the community efforts here, you can bring in areas for immigrants and different people, different backgrounds. Um, and just like the boat shed is already there as a brewery. Maker's Market is quite fun, but I think the fun one here is the Brooklyn Boulders co-working, which you never really think, or I, um, I wouldn't have really thought, having co-working inside a climbing gym you kind of think what but it's i've been there it's super famous it's super cool it's kind of like you get people like the whole point of co-working is almost to interact and meet and make connections and if you're sort of working there in a cool place it's you're going to meet different people and you're going to talk about it in a different way it, i think it's something that we should really push for more in many different areas like co-working could work with anything um, like one of the best co-working spaces in Harvard Square is Starbucks, which is amazing. Um, and then there's definitely a cultural aspect to this. And how do we strengthen this? Um, like I think with these great canvases, we have a buildings, these industrial buildings become great for murals for local artists. There could be creative studios where we have different rental systems for these artists to come in and actually work artists in residence. Um, you could have these currently spaces for cinemas during times of the year. And you might also have partnerships with cultural institutions. We have some large plate buildings, which some you might have a summer pavilion, like MoMA does, and ICA from Boston does here. So it's like, they might have, like the Biennale has their exhibitions now at Walsh Bay, at Barangaroo, and sometimes at Cockatoo Island, maybe here, yeah, Precinct 75 could be another place for art to be on exhibition. Um, another thing we're looking at is how do we talk about making place, making it attractive. And it's one thing to sort of have people visit once, like you come and see that, okay, great. But how do you actually make it a place that you want to come back to again and again? And it's very much about having neighborhood ownership because the place people come back to and again and again is because they live there is very important and you want to make sure that it's good for them but also how can you attract people from the surrounding community to come here and activate it as well and here it's really programming 
and these are amazing because like the image there the top left is Janet Eckelman and um, just this is a temporal event and it just sort of defines this place people come and see you can see the natural cinema on as well you might have dynamic installations you might have slide the square like in Melbourne and it's just sort of it can be this great series of events of different types and different audiences throughout the year here so it's almost like what's happening at p75 and you come here because you don't know what's on but there's you don't know what's on but it might actually be something interesting and it becomes more about the precinct than the activity and so here like proven examples of that would be um sort of the uh, 700 billion in the uk which every year different architects come to a pavilion or even the M pavilion in Melbourne, which is equally as exciting because it's so much about the program and public talks and the like. Um, I think we're going good for time. The, so this is the last project I wanted to talk about. And in this project, it's a nice arc because the first two are about process and about proposition. This is actually where I think the process has been sort of considered into a design response. And this project was actually I must credit Suzaki and Dillis Video and Renfro. This is a project that I was involved with about 10 years ago when I was working with Suzaki. And this was a design competition for Barangaroo Central in Sydney. And this was a partnership between Suzaki and DSR. And what this was, was looking at the idea here, this was working from the beginning, looking at what place is. What are the elements of this place? And we looked at it and said, it's nature. It's between nature, water, and the city. And just to give that an image, you can see here, this is Barangaroo at its current, well, not current state, because some of the buildings here are built, this is the south, and Barangaroo North, which is the park. So we said landscape, city, and water, and we are this precinct in amongst it. So we sort of, where they overlap. Um, and the brief at this point was to actually be a cultural hub. And I'm not sure what the current master plan is, but it still is very much a point of transition from the CBD down to the harbour and the water's edge and the headland park. So there is a plan in place. You can see kind of with this diagonal line throughout the different precincts. And we identified these sort of four main elements. On the left, you can see a diagrammatic representation of those in compliance with the current plan. Whereas on the right, you can see, you know, a provocation of what you might do for each. So the weave is the first one I'll come to, then the cultural ecosystem, uh, event space, and then amphibious urbanism. Now you can see just how we sort of to simply, you can almost see from this that rather than taking this straight line, we've decided to really sort of interrogate it and sort of bend it through and tear it apart in some ways. Um, so I think we talked about genius loci and connection to the country. Here's a depiction of the site at settlement. Um, and that's the headland park. That's the headland area that the headland park seeks to reference. And so that you can see that the site is more natural with the coves of the harbor coming through and the landscape and the topography and the levels and the like. And here you can see shortly after settlement as well, you can see this is that headland area. And so much of the site we're actually looking at is, was water and kind of still is. And it comes through to the Cockle Bay at the south. And that site then evolves through the 19th century with the development of a series of wharves. You can see Kent Street along here, coming up to Windmill Street, and this is Walsh Bay. And then again through the 20th century, uh, you can see the beginning of that giant podium that the Pope was standing on earlier. But a series of wharves, and along here is Hickson Road. And what you can start to see is the difference in levels. You can see the step up here, and again through up to the observatory hill. But what we started to do was to overlay all these different times and shoreline conditions and urban conditions over the current plan and start to look at what could we do with this? Can we interrogate this line a bit more? Um, and not just thinking in plan, we're thinking about it in elevation section. So this is the view along Hickson Road. Um, and this wall is actually carved down to Hickson Road's level, rather than a natural slope. And this sandstone, mix of sandstone and concrete wall, I think is a definer of place, if this has a definition, one of many. And 
started to look at things like interrogating here in this diagram, you can see the site level and then the Tixon Road. And this is that great wall we had a photo of. And it actually doesn't stop there. It goes up and then there's a series of buildings and wall buildings, wall and up to Reservatory Hill. So the site has this very interesting series of levels, which we thought to play into. And so you can see here, the weave manifested itself in a design suggestion here going from south from the towers down to Headland Park, taking that sort of sweep. But also on the east to the west on the bottom, looking at oops, sorry, how the different levels here might actually change and how we could plug into them. So you might actually approach the site from the upper level, but still also preserving these views across over the buildings. So you maintain the outlook from Observatory Hill, which is quite a heritage vista. Um, the second element was the cultural ecosystem. If this was to be a cultural hub, we were sort of playing around in the office with the idea of what if the, the opera house of so the sails literally sailed off into the harbour? And it, the point here was really about what if it's a series of small elements that make an ecosystem rather than one big shed? Um, and here, this was a diagram we kind of created um, looking at all the different elements of a cultural precinct and what they are from indigenous cultural centers to outdoor sculpture spaces to production spaces to theaters, dance companies, rehearsal, all the different elements that come together for all of that. And also looking at not just the uses, but when the actual cultural ecosystem may have cultural uses that are more active in the morning through to the daytime, say like university or dance colleges, through to the evening when the performances are. You sort of need before programming and after programming to sort of create this place, looking at it as a constantly, as an ecosystem that some things may fit into others. So dining areas would serve pre-activity and then rehearsal spaces as well, through to actual event spaces and then post-programming throughout this day. And this sort of manifested itself in a few ways, but here you can see this is actually like a diagram section. You can see Hickson Road and you have the large wall here, but actually sort of linking back to Kent Street up at the upper level. So you actually come across and you've actually got a natural bifurcation almost in a good way between sort of more residential uses and then the actual kind of presentation and collaboration spaces within it. And in the middle, is this public space, a public spine that weaves through the site. So really trying to link it all together. Um, the third provocation was around an event plaza. And so we're sort of looking at large open spaces on the harbour. And this was one of the few chances we sort of really deliver that. We've got Darling Harbour, we've got Circular Quay, we've got Macquarie's Chair, we've got a whole, what I think Roger's called the cultural ribbon and it goes around and it links all these spaces. And I think the ribbon almost now goes from Wilmaloo through to um, almost through the fish market site. And there's great chances for continuing it past Bays West now. But we thought this was a really great big stop on that ribbon. And one of the great public spaces we could really look at was St. Mark's Square in Venice. And just how it is this large scale on mass place, but it's also a place for evening programming where people can just be. And this is Lincoln Center in New York, which I think of as a similar scale and cultural programming of this and here. And you can also see, it can also be where your friends are just messing around on any given day in winter. And it's, the point here is it's on mass, but also the daily informal uses. And sort of that comes together here with this large event space, with a series of buildings and the main circulation coming through to it. And you can sort of see here the lower uses we talked about and the upper uses with that planar suggestion. Um, and here was more of a publication of what that space could be like, sort of where it really is focused towards the harbor with this element kind of in the harbour, which I'll get back to with the amphibious urbanism, which is here. And the fourth movie is the amphibious urbanism. And what this came from was, yes, we're on the water, but the site's history, and this is a photograph of the site from the early 20th century, is it's a deep water berth, so large ships would come. 
And in a way, a large ship is, well, a building, really. It's a program. It's something of an event. So why can't there be the idea of some element of this design or proposal actually being something that can come to or from the site and go around the harbour and be a temporal use? Um, that was also kind of furthered with, like I said and earlier on, the kind of idea that Sydney Harbour is Sydney's blood. And I think going further than that, touching the harbour is Sydney's birthright. And I think anyone in Sydney would agree that being able to touch the harbour is so special. And this is actually Oslo. It's an opera house. But it's just this amazing that this cultural pavilion, culture program, then also has a very public component that allows people to come and touch the water. Um, and so we had this idea of like, what if literally part of the culture building took off and went around the harbour? What if it went over to the opera house? What if it went over to Cockatoo Island, like a culture barge, which sounds a little crazy, but it's sort of like what Robert Smithson did here in the 20th century with this actual park that broke off and went around the harbour. So there could be an idea of that amphibious urbanism here. And sort of bringing that all together is this is one of the provocations and you can see here a series of things with the different levels of the below programming and above. You can see these levels of the site, this public aspect weaving through the site, really picking up on the levels going down to the water, picking up on this grand axis set up by the master plan and having this grand event space with this sort of amphibious element that may split off and go around the harbour. But this sort of brought it all together. That was one provocation. Um, another provocation of this one was here. And I thought this sort of put it in context um, where it was much more of a sculptural look with this building out in the harbour. It could be like you see the opera now and it's in the harbour. And just how that all fits back into its kind of like back where we started really with the idea of this genius loci of Sydney being its harbour. And I think this was a good place to sort of really end this and just have the last, just as a last summary, just, I think just to say it, what is place? It's really just thinking beyond the built form. It's really thinking about people. It's about activity. It's about environment and connectivity as well. And that's really, I think where I'll leave it for now. So I'll, I'll just say thank you very much. And I think we've got some time for discussion and questions. Perfect. Thank you very much, Lucien. Um, very interesting examples uh, you shared with us. And I um, see that, I guess, the core value for you and your practice is actually people. <laughs> people and the role of people in people, making people. places, which is um, pretty uh, true and interesting. Um, I would like to open it to the participants if they have any questions, and I also have one for you, but uh, let's see if I have a um, message in the chat box, if I can get it. I saw it was, I guess, from Justin, but yep. Oh, yeah, just a thank you message. Thank you, Lucy. <laughs> that was fascinating. Um, and Diane Westrop also thanks for the passion, Lucien. Exactly. We could see the translation of your passion in your work, <laughs> which was Fantastic. pretty evident. Yeah. Um, anyone has any specific questions for Lucien? Justin, would you like to turn on your mic? Justin is one of our um, colleagues, the course coordinator of Bachelor of Architecture at Curtin. Pretty oh, passionate wonderful. colleague. Yeah, I think he's going to turn on his mic. Should I stop sharing, you think? Um, so you could, yes, you could. So people can see uh, yeah, the, the images. Um, yeah, Justin, are you there? I think I can see your hands up. Justin, you speak. Can you hear me? Justin, you can speak through mine. Yeah, Justin, you could come to this room and speak through my mic as well, because <laughs> he's just. Um... Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, yes. hello. There we go. Lucien, I'm so sorry. My 
the machine keeps doing something weird. What I was going to ask you was going back to something you said earlier in the lecture, but it was around, um, and it's something that's been interesting some of us for a while, which is in that design process and in the early engagement in projects, how do you think the best ways are to include as many voices as possible in terms of both stakeholders, but also future users in project design and um, if you want at the inception stage almost? That's such an interesting question because you talked about the current users, definitely. And then future users, which almost comes into establishing that place vision, yeah. where who is the future user? And like, it's such an interesting question because I know there are so many smart technologies around now around engagement, but I think with COVID, we've seen the rise of that, but also it's really shown, particularly I know like in America, there's a lot of in communities which don't really have access to internet, for example. Mm. Yeah. So we think, oh, you know, like we can put out a survey on Zoom or something and, you know, everyone can just email it back. You're like, no, that's not really it. And I think, if anything, like we were talking earlier about how COVID sort of allowed us to reach a broader global, it's also shown us that you really, the potency of in person, yeah. of finding these ways, but having that recognition, I think, I, it's such a puzzle, isn't it? Of I mean, how to really achieve it but i think it's almost you don't want to say like case by case you've yeah. almost got to meet the community where they are and if you want to ask them how to be if you want to wonder how to engage them maybe that's simple as that ask them give them the microphone and see what happens yeah i think you're i think you're right it was interesting because what one of the reasons that i mentioned this thing was a uh, that question keeps referring to me because of some children in a school opposite a building that was being demolished and their concerns in a number of cases was where will the animals go? Where will the rats, where will the cockroaches go? And why didn't they ask us about the building? Because we're going to be living next to it for five or 10 years or whatever it is. And it was a fascinating sort of self-awareness on the part of the children that they were not part of the process. That's so fascinating. But I think that's almost, I think that would be it's like, give them the microphone. Exactly, yeah. Thank you. Just, thank you very much. Thanks, Justin. Um, Mark Taylor. Hi, Mark. I can read uh, out now your question or if you want you can just turn on your mic i'm not sure maybe i'll read uh, thanks for that do you have any favorite program programmatic activations that you've seen in your work and travels lucien oh wow that's a good question oh oh my god i just i think i put so many of them in the show like just that's, that's like the Carnival de Quebec is such a fun thing. Like I had the image of the ice palace and just how myself, like as an Australian seeing it was great, but seeing it with Americans and Canadians, it's like they put all the joyful things of winter into one place. So it's not just the ice palace. It's there's bogganing, there's sledding, there's maple candy making. There's just all these little things that I could just people's childhoods relived and that was so special um it's a, it's oh i don't think i'd even want to limit it like so many things like being in the heat of july in boston and there's like splash pads and just it's just basically a bit of asphalt with a fountain that sticks out of it and mm. just kids are going crazy and that's all it is because then in winter it's just covered in ice you know but I think some of those things, I think I want to say it is, it's the little daily activities, the things that you'd never even plan for. Like, it's not even like an activity that was planned. It's just like someone's decided to use the space this way, that it probably was never intended to be used that way, but it just, <laughs> and I think that's the best. Like I mentioned with the light rail being built, I think I couldn't find a photo of it, but like outside town hall in Sydney is where people often busk and street perform. And there was actually a series of concrete blocks and people would stand on them and perform and people would be sitting on the blocks around them. And like, it really was like love amongst the ruins. I almost it, like it's these blocks, which are there for purely utilitarian reasons become places of celebration. It's, I think that's probably one of my favorites. Um, thanks, Lucien. Um, I guess I would be asking the last question because it is three minutes to one. If anyone else doesn't have any question, because I think I need to prioritize the participants. Yeah, I think I'm 
I don't have any hands up. So, um, Lucien, considering the urban fabric and context of Australian cities and the, you know, urban sprawl and motor vehicles dependencies really everywhere, and especially in Perth, what we can see, mm -hmm. what do you think we can provide to encourage that social life and vibrancy, especially in um, suburban areas? And what are the priorities in your opinion because yes you gave lots of examples and strategies but really i mean as a designer what do you think are the priorities well priorities of people <laughs> um, but I, I think it's a really interesting question and the way to answer it would be very much around yes there is the suburban condition and that is very much home for many people and I think we're seeing, for example, there's the 15 minute city. And I think we're seeing it as well in different cities. I think you see it more in Europe. And this is a caveat that I think urban environments that have been developed before the motor car have found themselves able to be going back to situations without the motor car, like in Barcelona, they've done the mega blocks, um, mm. which is really interesting as an example. But I think here in the Sydney and an Australian condition uh, where it is quite different, um, and obviously developed with the motor car in mind, is looking at opportunities for around movement and place, which I think is something that the governments are at least focusing or at least called their whole document mm -hmm. movement and place, whether or not they're meaning it. But how transport infrastructure, whether it is mm -hmm. cars, whether it can be actually considered, so looking at the way streets are designed, so that maybe if you live a kilometer or more from a train station, but that walking can actually be much more pleasure pleasant you know you're less likely to drive um mm -hmm. and even there could be different bus networks or there could be active transport networks so you may actually um there's often i'm not sure what it's called not called kiss and ride but say where you can actually drive to a certain point nearer the city and then bike for the rest of it and it's sort of a split modal system but i think yeah, yeah. we're seeing it a lot in cities all around the world especially when people are driving less, although I think mm. now after COVID people are driving more um, because people don't want to be on packed trains anymore. But you actually saw streets becoming a bit more about people. There's a, like a renaissance of people, streets, streets of people. And mm. they recognize that like parking cars was 20% of the street. And it's just 20% of public space is just used for private use. Parking, yeah. So I think, I'm not sure if I'm really answering the question, but I think mm, it's coming yeah. at is how movement and how people can connect. So whether you, but your home, your family home is near the daycare, near a school, near a train station, near a business, and how the connections between those is streets can actually become enhanced and better spaces. That we talk exactly. about a kilometer, like a kilometer along a highway, walking along a highway versus kilometer walking through sort of a shaded tree lined street, which has got mm. protection from cars it's chalk and cheese exactly so I think the no, that. that's right yeah i think you hit the point um definitely and um facilitating you know the the active modes of transportation generally um will pre bring people along and will encourage the social life as you mentioned you know transport is uh, playing an important role um no fantastic thank you so thank much you. for um, sharing your uh, design insights and thoughts, your projects with us. It was a great pleasure. And thank you very much again for accepting our invite, Lucien. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about it. I don't think it was a hacker that I'm very passionate. So that was, it was such an exciting time to talk to everyone. And, Perfect. Um, for us as well. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you again. Hopefully we can see you in person in future in Perth. Yeah. <laughs> I've been to Perth before and love to come back. So. Sure, no worries. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks everyone for great. joining us. Thank you. Everyone uh, the for recording joining. and the recording of the talk uh, is uh, will be uploaded on uh, architalk.org website soon, maybe uh, latest tomorrow. Wonderful. Lots of thank, thank you, you messages. <laughs> Lucien. <laughs> Wonderful. Cheers.